Hey there, and welcome back to Mass Effect 2. My name is Pete, and today we complete one more small side mission, but once that one is behind us, we will recruit our next squad member. So, thank you all so much for leaving feedback on the last episode. The vast majority of you were in favor of increasing the size of our squad before we embark on any other adventures, so that is exactly what we're going to do. In the meantime, however, we have one more small mission to take care of, as we were notified at the end of the last episode that a group of Batarian terrorists had taken over a missile base and that they had already launched two missiles at a human colony. Needless to say, we will try to intervene and conveniently enough the mission takes place right here in Sigurd's Cradle, however not in the Decorus but in the Skepsis system. That is also the reason why we haven't surveyed that system yet, so let's quickly get that over with as well. We start things off with the ice planet Crick, an inhospitable world with no breathable atmosphere, but instead with a decent iridium deposit should you be interested in that. Moving to the outer territories of the system, we continue with Kaimowitz, another frosty planet that will very likely never be inhabited, but one that might be intriguing for miners, as more than 15,000 units of platinum can be found here. Up next is the hydrogen methane gas giant Pauling, a planet with 66 boons and about as many minerals. In short, this is not a prime target if you're looking to mine, and there are better candidates available in this very system. Unfortunately though, our next planet is not one of those, as Wallace here is just really really hot, but doesn't offer much in terms of minerals. Moving on, we have Darwin, which has a rather ironic name considering its very unfriendly surface temperature of over 700 degrees Celsius. Still, with a few probes it can be of use, because there is a nice amount of iridium to be found here. And that brings us to the second to last planet Watson, a garden world that is home to several human colonies. It also has a great amount of resources, including one of the larger Element Zero deposits, so stopping by is well worth it. And with that, we can now head over to Watson's moon Franklin. I have detected an anomaly. With several spaceports and missile bases, Franklin serves as a defense station for Watson's colonies, but it also once again has a decent supply of iridium. And one of those missile bases I just mentioned has apparently come under Batarian control, and even worse, the attackers have already launched two missiles against a human colony on Watson. But there is still hope if we can manage to find the missile control panel in the base, so let's assemble our squad. We will fight Batarian enemies with shields, so let's bring Kasumi for her area overload ability, and because we are on a timer for this mission, we will also bring Zaid for some extra firepower and his inferno grenades. Speaking of which, after once again skipping Shepard, those grenades are also receiving an upgrade now, as we can spend 7 of Zaid's 8 points to max out and evolve this ability. To no one's surprise, the evolution then comes with either a damage or an impact radius bonus. Heavy Inferno grenades do quite a bit more damage than Inferno blast grenades, however they do not reach as far and the grenade also explodes into fewer fragments. In my opinion, both are excellent choices, the damage improvement is certainly noticeable for the heavy version, but we will still go with blast because the grenade can put enemies on fire and stagger them, and the more enemies it's able to affect, the better for us. Kasumi has no points to spend and we will also leave our weapon loadout as it is, there is no need to bring anything special for this mission. Definitely some fighting here. 
Alright, here we go. Our first group of hostiles is immediately engaging. And as you can see in the bottom right corner, we are on a 5 minute timer until the missiles reach their destination and destroy the colony. However, I personally find this timer to be fairly generous, even on insanity difficulty, as there are really only two fights to win, and as you can see here, the first one is not that hard to finish, and we even get another punch and shoot combo for the brawler achievement. Now it's time to head into the other direction, and behind this door right here we will encounter a slightly larger group of hostiles, so we should already prepare to dash into cover immediately. And there we are, as soon as the doors open we run for the nearest crate and send Kasumi and Zaid into cover as well, because we are now being shot at from multiple angles. Straight ahead of us we have a few Batarian troopers, not that much harder to take down than the Blue Suns troopers we faced in the last few episodes, but since they are fairly spread out, area of effect abilities like Kasumi's area overload or Zaid's inferno grenades are only of limited use. While we dispatch of the enemies right in front of us, we also want to keep an eye on our right flank, because that is the most convenient pathway for the rest of the Batarian forces to engage us. That is also why we want to get over there as quickly as possible, to cut off their advances and to drive them back into a position where we have the high ground advantage. The box on the right side in the corner over here works very nicely for that, and we absolutely also want to blow up any explosive container in the area. Now, not only do we have the high ground here, we have also completely exposed the two most dangerous enemies in this fight, the two Batarian commanders at the other side of the room. Their only cover does not protect them against shots from this angle, and for some reason they are also not too eager to find a new spot to hide. So it might not even be necessary to focus too much attention on them, simply because they are A very far away, and B easily killed without any sort of cover. The Batarian troopers, meanwhile, can be a bit more annoying simply because of their numbers, which almost never give us a real break in the enemy fire, and even in cover our squad members do not take too kindly to that. And you can see it here, Zaid already goes down, but we won't waste any medigel on him, the fight is almost over and we should be able to take care of the remaining hostiles with Kasumi. And here we are, we don't get the punch and shoot kill, but the bulk of the enemy forces is defeated and we have about half of the time still left on the clock. Enough time to grab the palladium crate in the corner here and to then also loop back and go up on that middle platform where the first enemies were standing. Here we can find some power cells and since we fired the M920 cane last episode, we can definitely make use of some heavy weapon ammo. And now it's time to head downstairs towards the final door of this mission, but instead of opening it, we will first take a quick glance at a mysteriously placed sword underneath the stairs here. I have no idea why or how it got here, and we won't let it distract us for too long, so let's continue with the door. Switching over to the sniper rifle is also an excellent idea at this point, because it allows us to immediately land a well-placed headshot against the Batarian commander at the missile control panel. And before he can really get back up, we're already in range to activate Adrenaline Rush again and to get punch and shoot combo number 16 with the shotgun. At this point, we can swiftly grab 3750 credits from the wall safe and then activate the missile kill switch console. Alright, a bit of a twist which now forces us to decide. We could either save the industrial district around the spaceport, which would keep the colony viable as it is worded here, or we could save the residential district and with that hundreds of lives, but the destruction of the spaceport and industry would force them to evacuate, simply because the colony would have nothing left to do or to produce at that point. Still, to me evacuation seems preferable to death, so we will apply the kill switch to the missile heading for the residential area. And with the colonists saved, but the infrastructure around them destroyed, we have finished our task here and can complete the mission. 
And there we are, another quick and easy assignment is behind us. Unfortunately, we receive no morality points for our decision, which is somewhat surprising considering the vast consequences it had, but at least we get a few experience points, the usual 7,500 credits, as well as 2,000 units of palladium out of it. All in all, not too bad for a mission that took slightly over 3.5 minutes to complete. Now here we are back on the Normandy, and since we wrapped up this assignment in no time, let's get one more conversation in before we go. Grunt seems very agitated. You may want to check in on him. And no, it is not Grunt we will be talking to. Instead, now that we have completed his loyalty mission, it is Jacob. Commander, can I help you with something? I'm more interested in just talking for a bit. Sounds good. I could use some downtime. There's always something, right? The way some people talk, we may as well be dead already. Hard for the crew to relax on this kind of job. Right, now we can take two general approaches to this conversation that will both earn us Paragon points, either a gritty, realistic outlook, or a slightly less serious, casual, and somewhat more optimistic one, one that doesn't really focus as much on the futility of it all, but one that is also a bit cheesy in my opinion. And I think Shepard would be one to keep it real with his crew, so we'll go with that approach by selecting the option in the middle here. There's no time off for us, Jacob. Not in this job. I'm just getting tired of hearing how we're gonna die no matter what. Not a great motivator. No one said it would be easy. Never thought it would be, but five minutes of, hey, we'll get through this, couldn't hurt. And here's the point where we can obtain Paragon points, two of them to be exact, for selecting the option at the top. We could pretend, but the simple fact is if we bring anything less than our A-game, everyone is dead. I'm going all out, don't doubt that. But you might die has never worked as well for me as you can live. Guess that's just the way I see things. Anyway, I need to get back to work. Good talking to you. Right, and here we are at the end of what was admittedly a fairly short episode. But fear not, the next one will be considerably longer, as we set out to recruit everyone's favorite Quarian Tali, who, apart from Garrus, is the only squad member from Mass Effect 1 who makes a return in this game. Regarding today's mission, I actually feel like the game could have benefited more from missions like these, not necessarily because of their length, but because of the need to make a meaningful choice at the end. I fondly remember the Bring Down the Sky DLC for Mass Effect 1, which focused exactly on making those tough choices that really embody everything the whole Paragon Renegade morality system stands for, but both in the first as well as in the second game of the series, those deciding moments are comparatively rare. In my opinion, it is then even more unfortunate that when such a mission appears, just like today for example, the choice that is made is then not rewarded with morality points or even with a short follow-up message or dialogue detailing the consequences. As it happens, the decision we made today could have very well been the exact opposite of what we picked, and the impact on the overall storyline of the game would have been exactly the same, none at all. Now, I don't want to be overly negative to close out this episode, but with the mission being so fast-paced, I really saw no other point in the video to squeeze in those thoughts, and I would actually be interested in what you think about the whole thing. I actually remember quite a few of you commenting on the Bring Down the Sky episode, which I have linked on screen by the way, and saying how this was such a well-done mission, so I assume you have a similar point of view. But then again, you might also play or watch me play the game for entirely different reasons than to make meaningful choices, so let me know if this is something that bothers you as well or if it does not really affect your enjoyment at all. And with that, I think I have rambled on for long enough now, let's make the cut right here. As always, I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did then give it a thumbs up, and if you want to support me and my channel further then feel free to subscribe or to check out and maybe pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers.